There we go. Hello and uh, good morning and welcome to um, Ontario Network of CAPC and CPNP Projects, uh, one of our network webinars. And this one is called um, Mindful Connections. And what, how I would like to start is by just uh, pausing and offering a land acknowledgement. And uh, our network is uh, spread across uh, all of what is called the province of Ontario. And as a network, we, we give gratitude and thanks to the indigenous peoples um, all over this region um, for the land in which we work and play and serve families and um, allowing us to do the, the good work that we do. <clears throat> And um, as I mentioned to Kathy, I'm actually uh, joining you from uh, near Penticton, uh, British Columbia, which is the traditional lands of the Okanagan Silks people. So I want to acknowledge that as well. So for those of you just joining in, welcome. We're going to spend some time this morning uh, talking about and reflecting on mindfulness. Um, I'm welcoming people to have their cameras on. That's great. It's really nice to see your faces. Um, but again, just a reminder that this is being recorded and, um, and will be shared within our network. So if you're comfortable with that, it's great to have you here. And um, let's see, what else did I want to do? Um, I, I will be sharing a link to these slides that, that I have if they're of interest to people. And um, I also have a resources page that I'll be sharing um, a link to as well. Uh, okay, so let's get going here. Let's, let's start at the beginning and, and just sort of approaching this with a, a beginner's mind because um, the concept of mindfulness is, I'm sure, not new to, to any of you. Um, it's something that um, has been just increasing in, in popularity in the recognition of, of the benefits to us, um, to our mental health, and uh, certainly to um, the folks that we work with. And um, so let's think a little bit together about, you know, what, what is mindful, mindfulness? And um, there are actually, there's a popular definition out there um, that's often recited by John Kabat-Zinn. If you've been doing any reading or exploring of mindfulness, his name has probably come up for you. Um, he's really kind of known as a bit of the, um, I don't know, the father or I mean, a leader, a thought leader in mindfulness. And what, um, he has said is that uh, mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And, um, it, you know, it's often helpful to pause and actually, you know, unpack that a little bit, you know, think concretely about um, that it's attention that is, um, it's a particular way of paying on attention. And the on purpose piece is really important. Um, that this is something we are intending to do. Um, we are finding ourselves in the present moment. We're trying to avoid perhaps, um, you know, casting our mind backwards and renumerating over the, the thing we, wish we didn't say yesterday or do. Um, and also uh, casting our minds forward into perhaps our anxieties about what's, what's coming up. And then the last piece uh, around uh, non-judgment is really important. And I think often for many of us, one of the most challenging parts of, of mindfulness, right, is, is letting go um, the harsh judgments we often um, cast upon ourselves and um, engaging with the present moment with a sense of peace and, and compassion. I've also got another definition here by a uh, woman named Susan Gillis Chapman. And um, I wanted to, oh, I didn't bring the book up. Oh, oh well, it's okay. I've got an image of it. Um, she has written a book, which I've drawn from really strongly for this presentation. Uh, it's a book I've read in the last six months. And 
it's uh, really impacted me deeply. And it's called um, the five keys of mindful communication. And we're actually going to be exploring a lot of um, Susan Gillis Chapman's concepts in this in our time together this morning. And she says that mindfulness is the mind's natural capacity to remember what we're doing in the present moment. This power can weaken when we neglect, when we practice mindlessness, or can be strengthened with tra training in mindfulness meditation. So it's the mind's natural capacity to remember what we are doing in the present moment, always bringing us back to center. Um, so there may be other definitions that, that you've come across or, or ways of understanding mindfulness, and I'd be happy to, to hear about it if you wanted to uh, you know, put something in the chat or, or unmute yourself. But that's sort of what where we're starting from. Um, oh, and I see Bobby has said hello. Um, there's Bobby, Kim, Veronica, and Maureen. The Toy Bus Program folks, always glad to see the Toy Bus Program folks here. Welcome. Good morning. Um, the other uh, piece that, uh, again, drawing a lot very heavily from Susan Gillis Chapman today, but in her book, she talks about um, two concepts of uh, uh, one being me first and the other being we first. And um, she suggests that um, mindfulness is when we are open and attending to ourselves and those around us. And we're coming from a place of we first, sort of a, um, you know, uh, uh, a group, a healthy group mentality. Whereas mindlessness, which is mentioned in the, in her definition, she says is when we are closed and protective of our own interests at the expense of others. When we get into a me first mindset, which is, I think a really common trap we all fall into, you know, all the time. <laughs> I, I don't, I, and I think it's not about saying we have to, we should expect that we live our entire lives in, in we first, but that we just develop the ability to discern and check in. Where are we coming from right now? Are we coming from our we first place or are we coming from a me first place? It's just a, um, a way to check in. All right. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, again, I, I'm. I know that mindfulness is is something that um, we generally probably have had some awareness of coming into this. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just giving you perhaps a bit of context on me and um, how I come to this. Um, I don't know if I actually introduced myself at the beginning, which is probably pretty presumptuous. Um, I guess I just feel so comfortable in this space as the uh, project lead. So I'm, I'm Sydney Bell, and I'm the, the project lead for the Ontario Network of CAPC and CPNP projects. And uh, But I'm sort of coming to you today with a bit of a different hat on. Um, uh, as a social worker and a psychotherapist, um, I also run a practice where I, I counsel people. And um, like all of you, I've been sort of aware of and looking to become more mindful in my day-to-day -day life and my, and my work with clients. Um, um, I would say that um, what really brought me into thinking about and looking to practice mindfulness was that my, my practice um, for many years has focused on working with people who are looking to heal from body shame, right? And looking to nurture uh, a positive uh, body image. And a big part of that is um, ma making a reconnection with, with the body. And mindfulness plays a, a, a big part in that. And um, we tend to work on things um, people who struggle with their relationship with their body often struggle with their relationship with food and, you know, navigating their hunger and fullness signals, uh, our relationship to exercise and movement. So practices of, of mindfulness are um, really helpful 
in, in that kind of uh, healing journey. And as my practice has grown, I of course come to see that it's not just about healing body image uh, or relationship with our body where mindfulness is helpful. It's, it's a, I think a foundational piece in all of our mental, uh, mental health uh, journeys and, and support. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about that too is um, I'm, I also really, um, I practice from a self-compassion uh, perspective and actually use a um, compassion focused therapy uh, approach in my work with, um, with people. And um, what I have learned is mindfulness is an integral and such an important part of being able to uh, recognize and offer ourselves compassion, right? Because to be able to, to be able to comfort ourselves and, or offer ourselves compassion, we have to have an awareness of what is going on for us. Right. And, um, it's the practice, uh, practice of mindfulness that helps us develop that, that awareness of, okay, this is what, what is going on for me. And okay. I can pause and have an awareness and, um, perhaps offer myself some of that such important um, self-kindness and, and compassion. So they are so um, interlinked. And one of the books that I have in my um, recommended reading or resource list is called The Mindful Path to Self-Compassion by Christopher Germer. And um, he really explores how the two practices of mindfulness and self-compassion um, you know, support each other so beautifully. Um, really, really highly recommended. Okay, so I think that's enough about about me, but I just wanted to give you some context about, you know, where I've come from in terms of um, the practice of mindfulness. Um, I think it might be nice to do a, a short practice right now. Um, I've got a mindful body scan that, um, that I'd like to lead us through. I think it would take about maybe five minutes. So, um, you know, if you'd like to participate, um, feel free to do so. Um, if you don't want to participate, even just sitting in, in some, some quietness and, and breathing would be lovely. Um, but what I'll invite everybody to do now is to just get yourself seated comfortably. And uh, like I say, I'll just take us through a mindfulness exercise that is just going to, you know, check in with, uh, with, with our body, right? Because the, our body is such an important tool um, in becoming fully present to ourselves. So get yourself seated comfortably. And if you would like, you know, you're, I invite you to close your eyes or um, if you're not comfortable closing your eyes, maybe just, um, you know, looking downward a little bit to help bring the, um, your focus inward. So settle into your body and bring your attention to your breath. Don't try to control your breath. Just notice it and allow it to peacefully flow. Notice it moving in and out. I invite you to let your shoulders relax and notice where your body is making contact with the floor or the chair. Feel the sensations of contact, pressure, temperature. And feel free to adjust to make yourself comfortable as you need. So we'll sit just for a few more moments resting in this natural flow of breath and allowing our minds and body to become calm. Let your intention be to experience your physical aliveness exactly as it is in this moment without judgment. Now bring your attention to the top of your head and notice the sensations there. Let your attention move down and feel the sensations on the back of your head, on either side of your head and through your ears. Bring awareness to your forehead, eyes, nose, cheeks, 
jaw and mouth. Allow yourself to experiment with feeling the body from within the body. How does that shift your focus? As we connect with various parts of our body, sometimes we feel numbness or sometimes there are no noticeable sensations. If that is your experience, don't worry, just notice and keep the breath flowing in and out. Now let's continue our journey downward and bring your attention to your neck and throat, noticing without any judgment, whatever sensations you feel. Be aware of each of your shoulders from the inside. Then let your attention move slowly down your arms, feeling the sensations and aliveness there. Bring awareness to your hands, making sure they are resting easy and effortless. Feel each finger from the inside. Feel the palms, the back of the hands, noticing any tingling, pulsing, pressure, warmth, or cold. Arrive into the presence of your body. Embrace your physical space. As we do this, images or thoughts will naturally arise. Don't fight them. Simply notice them passing through and gently return your attention to the sensations in your body. Now bring your awareness to your chest exploring the sensations in that whole area. Slowly, let your awareness sink down into your stomach. With a soft, receptive awareness, take some moments to feel the sensations in your abdomen. Now move your attention to your upper back, feeling the sensations in the area around your shoulder blades. Moving down, become aware of the mid and lower back, and then the entire spinal column. What are the sensations that are arising? Now we'll move slowly down through the legs, feeling them from within. Explore the sensation in our feet and toes. So now let's shift and open our attention to include our whole body in a comprehensive way. Be aware of the body as a field of changing sensations. Can you sense the subtle energy field that vitalizes and gives life to every cell, organ in your body? Is there anything in your experience that is solid or unmoving? Is there any center or boundary in the field of sensation? Is there any solid self you can locate that possesses these sensations? As you rest in awareness of your whole body, if particular sensations call your attention, bring a soft and allowing attention to them. Don't try to manage or manipulate your experience. Don't grasp or push away. Simply open to the changing dance of sensations, feeling your life from the inside out. If no particular sensations call your attention, Remain open to feeling energy simultaneously in all parts of the body.
And now we are going to begin to let go this exercise. And I invite you to bring your attention back to your breath, feeling it once again, flowing in and out of your body. Become aware of any sounds in the room or the sounds of my voice. When you're ready, open your eyes and we'll continue our time together. How's everybody doing? Okay, good. Well, I hope you found that helpful in, again, that sort of invitation to um, become fully present in the moment uh, with openness and, and awareness and lack of judgment, right? With, with compassion and, and understanding. So where was I? Okay. So why, why do we want to spend time thinking about mindfulness and, and nurturing it um, in, in our life? How does it help? Why is it important? Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, thinking about people who, are, um, who I've worked with who are healing from, from body shame, um, there's this, I think, this just pervasive epidemic all of us are facing in terms of disconnection, both from our physical selves and from, um, you know, the, the ability to be um, in the present moment. And um, uh, certainly all the lovely toys and tech and engagement, which I love a lot, <laughs> uh, tend to, uh, you know, support us in that disconnection, unfortunately. Um, I was just talking with somebody who is uh, was working on her kind of relationship with with her phone and um, that, you know, she was inviting herself every time she reached for her phone just to check in. Like, why am I reaching for my phone? Right. And is it? Oh, yes. I'm waiting for an email about the upcoming meeting. Okay, absolutely. Or do I need to check my schedule for today? But she noticed that sometimes she reaches for her phone when she's feeling anxious or is feeling a little bored or not quite not do, knowing what to do with herself. And um, just wanting to encourage yourself to perhaps, you know, are there other things I can do when, when I'm feeling uh, anxious? If I spend a little bit of time in mindful reflection, perhaps I can unpack a little bit more that, um, no, it's not really my phone I need to stare at right now. Maybe I need to go have a little chat with my, my partner or my child about something that's on, on my mind, right? Or maybe there's some other self-care that, that I need to do. So um, we are put um, in many ways at a great, greater risk of being disconnected. Um, so much of our time is spent fretting about, as I said earlier, we fret about the imagined future or remunerating over, over what is past. And um, when that happens, we distance ourselves from our current reality. And we miss just so many opportunities for connection and, and healing and growth. Um, so mindfulness allows us to become more fully aware of ourselves and the, the world around us. Um, so here are some of the, um, there's been lots of, of research and, um, and study on the benefits of, um, you know, nurturing mindfulness in, in our lives. And, um, you know, there's, uh, we can point to, you know, the ability to de decrease the stress in our life, our psychological pain, um, things like depression and anxiety. Um, there's science that shows that mindful practices can help us deal with illnesses or support our recovery more quickly sometimes, um, and just general overall improved health, um, our heart health, Im immune response. So there's just really, um, there's lots of positive reasons to um, pursue uh, mindfulness and, and um, whether that's, you know, informal mindful practices like meditation or uh, just a general 
uh, approach to how we in, engage with our activities day to day, which was actually, yes, that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of mindful living, because um, many people think that um, the only way to practice mindfulness is to sit in a formal um, meditation practice. And certainly um, it's a very positive thing that one can do um, to, to have some sort of formal um, meditation practice or yoga or qigong or you know so many of the the practices that are out there um, but we also want to think about how can we bring a fully present awareness to our just regular activities day to day what opportunities do we have to be fully in the present moment and a really great way to to begin um bringing mindfulness more regularly into our day-to-day -day is to start with one activity, whether it's and, and something simple like brushing our teeth or um, uh, getting dressed in the morning or walking the dog. <laughs> you can see I'm a dog and animal lover. Um, to choose an activity where we set an intention to be fully present in, in that activity, right? Um, and then that is something that, that we can build on. And again, I don't think it's about, you know, expecting ourselves to be absolutely fully present in, in everything that we do all the time. In fact, my mind kind of goes to, um, are, are many of you aware of circle of security? Um, and, and how we talk about it's not about being a perfect parent at all. I, I don't think it's about trying to be a perfectly mindful person and expecting that, you know, 100% of our day will just be all, you know, zen and in tune. But um, in circle security, they talk about good enough parenting. And, you know, if that you can, you know, aim for like, what was, is it 25 or 35% of the time that we have those meaningful connections with our kids? I, you know, I think it's, it's helpful to think of um, um, living mindfully the, the, the same way, right? That, you know, we look to have at least some part of our day where we're having um, a fully present, uh, connected and non-judgmental experience of ourselves and, and those around us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let me check my notes here. Um, uh, breath awareness is often a focal point in, in, in mindful living. And in almost every book or course you'll take, the encouragement will be to start with, with breath awareness. And that is a really good place to, um, to begin. Um, we are looking for opportunities to pause and pay attention. Okay, I've already mentioned that. Okay. So, yeah, I think that the, the main message here is again recognizing that there are, um, like I said, those formal practices that you can do take the yoga class, take the meditation class, do meditation, but also what are the ways that we can bring it just in, into our, our day to day life, this mindful awareness? So let's bring the lens, then expanding it beyond um, our own our own life to thinking about, you know, we're all helping professionals working with people. So how what role does mindfulness play in our um, ourselves as helping professionals? Um, so thinking again about that tendency to either um, ruminate about the past or fret about the future, um, that can definitely sort of take us out of where we need to be to be fully present for somebody that we're working with and, and supporting. And um, mindfulness practices improve focus, they increase awareness of our feelings and help us, which is really important to regulate our emotions. And um, many of us are aware of that sort of concept of, of dysregulation. And when we're in that space, we're not really in a space to be helpful to, to someone else, right? So practices of mindfulness help us to um, 
be able to respond better to others in uncomfortable situations. So as I was thinking about this, um, you know, and the things I was reading, um, these are sort of the points that, that I landed on that um, de developing a mindfulness practice or a, a mindful presence, actually really like that, that term, a mindful presence in our work, um, support us in, in being fully present with the people we work with, in increases our, the awareness of our own physical, emotional and spiritual state. We are less likely to project or overlay our own emotions or triggers onto the people we work with. Uh, it supports us in negotiating healthy boundaries, uh, re can reduce our need for control, which can, can come up in helping relationships and uh, especially helps us to be aware of maybe when we fall into that savior trap um, with, with the people that, that we work with. So that's just sort of a general, general overview in terms of um, uh, mindfulness uh, supporting us in, in the workspace. Now, I've pulled together three tools or approaches that um, I've really come to rely on in terms of supporting um, my mindfulness, my own spiritual growth, my own connection with myself, but also in um, navigating uh, when I'm working with other people. And um, so the first one is this concept of holding space, which I, um, which I really like. I often think of, um, especially um, even, so I have lots of different roles as a social worker, right? And you see me in my network lead role where often, you know, I'm, you know, leading groups or um, holding meetings. Um, or there's my, you know, my psychotherapy practice where I'm working with people one on one. And I find the concept of holding space fits with both of these ways. Um, I often describe my when I'm doing community development or group facilitation that that's a holding space role. Or when I'm, again, working with people one on one, I'm, I'm holding space. And um, I've often found it hard to articulate what holding space is. Um, and a few years ago, uh, a woman, um, she's a, a teacher and a, um, uh, you know, a group, a group facilitator in Winnipeg, and you may have heard of her. Her name is Heather Plett. And she wrote an article on holding space that just went viral because she really articulated really well what is this whole concept of of holding space. And in the resource um, document that I've got, I have the link to that article. You'll be able to read that for yourself. But what I wanted to do was pull out from that article, I think she has eight points or eight, eight reflections on what holding space is. And I thought that that would be of interest to us because I think it really is, um, well, is amazingly reflective of what mindfulness is. So Heather Plett says that holding space is gentle, non-judgmental support and guidance. And she unpacks that a little further with these sort of, she calls them tips in the articles of ways to, to hold space. Um, the first one is um, give people permission to trust their own intuition and wisdom. Give people only as much information as they need or can, can handle. I know I fall into that trap sometimes. I think of you know, providing too much, like going overboard a little bit in the information that I'm providing. Uh, don't take people's power away. Um, work to keep our own ego out of the work. Uh, help people to feel safe enough to fail, which I think is a really um, uh, interesting um, interesting tip that she provides. Um, and because and, I think we often, we don't remember the importance of, uh, or we have such a success mindset that we forget how important uh, our failures are and what we can learn from them. So helping people to feel safe enough to fail and to learn and grow from those failures. Um, 
Give guidance and help with humility and thoughtfulness. Create a container for complex emotions, fear, trauma, etc. Allow people to make different decisions and have different experiences than you would. I think that can often be a, a challenge for us when, when we're working with folks. So we, we can get really set in, you know, we really want to see people you know, grow and heal and succeed, succeed, but we have often our own vision of what that looks like. And we have to be careful to allow, to make sure that we are stepping back and allowing people to heal, grow and succeed in the ways that they, they want to do that. Yeah. So had anybody else heard of um, Heather Plett at this time and, and the whole concept of, of hold, holding space? Um, yeah, she's, of course, she's got a whole big, you know, thing and training program that one could take. Um, it's, it's really sort of grown for her, but, um, I think even just you know, taking a moment and, and reading her article is, is really interesting and, and really insightful in, in supporting us in being mindful, uh, helping professionals. And um, yeah, if anybody has any thoughts or comments at, at any time as we're hanging out together today, please feel free. Um, have I lit? Yeah, um, yeah, it's the permissions are set. So feel free to unmute yourself or put questions or comments in the chat. So that's the, the first kind of approach or way of thinking that I find really helpful in um, having a, a mindful based practice in, in working with people, the, the idea of holding space. The second one will maybe be familiar to any of you who, um, who were able to take part in our online conference um, in February is the polyvagal theory, um, which is a, an embodied uh, practice approach. And um, this is, uh, something that I've been reading and learning about for the past couple of years and really bringing into the work I do with people as a psychotherapist. And um, I find it really powerful uh, way to get in tune with the wisdom that that's in our body and for um, us to be able to be aware of what's going on for us and to um, uh, perhaps ensure that we're emotionally regulated as we're coming into uh, support. So I'm just curious who, who here actually did uh, go, was able to, you, you went to Dan, um, not Courtney Rolfe's presentation. And I've got a link to that, uh, that recording of that webinar as well on, on the resources page if you um, want, if you haven't had a chance to, to see it or, or want to be refreshed, but, um, Polyvagal theory can help us understand our bodies working um, and thus aid us in changing our nervous system's response to better tackle stress and trauma. Um, depending on the situation and environment, the nervous system can shift from one to another. And I'll, I'll show a graphic of the, um, the three states in a moment. Um, well, actually, I'll just show it right now just for a really quick refresher, the, the basic idea between polyvagal theory, um, the, it refers to the vagus nerve, right? Which um, goes from uh, kind of our abdomen up to the base of our spine. And um, all three of our nervous system um, processes are, are attached to the vagus nerve, which um, really sort of connects um, our feeling and our body to, to our brain. And the idea is that there are three um, spaces or three um, potential states that, that we are in all the time. At every moment, we are in one of these three states. We are, we're either feeling um, you know, shut down and pulled in and, and feeling disconnected um, or our uh, parasits, parasit, parasympathetic system is engaged and we might be, have a bit of a elevated heart rate and find ourselves in fight or flight um, or we're feeling uh, relatively safe and we're able to be in the, um, uh, the social engagement um, 
uh, part of our nervous system is activated. Um, so I just find it really helpful if exploring this, this approach, you get to sort of learn your own signs of, you know, recognizing what, where am I at right now? You know, am I feeling kind of shut down or pulling within and or disconnected? Or am I feeling activated? Um, or am I, am I feeling relatively calm and able to, to engage? And I think an awareness of this for us as helping professionals, um, both um, it supports our own mental well-being. It can be a tool to work with people to help them recognize where they're at and engage in some emotional regulation. And I think it's also helpful for those times of when we are working with somebody, those those. Um, opportunities to we want to make sure that we are in a relatively calm and engaged state when we're working with people to be able to connect fully um, um, and you know be fully present be able to do that holding space piece okay and again in the resources page there's um there's also uh you know uh, uh, information about a book and a whole bunch of resources that the author deb dana has put together on on this approach and finally uh, we're going to go to the book i was going on about at the beginning the one that has in this last six months really just um i've really resonated with and um really looking to integrate a lot of this um uh, of what uh, susan gillis chapman is teaching so the book is called the five keys to mindful communication and um she outlines these five keys, which she calls um, mindful presence, mindful listening, mindful speech, mindful relationship, and mindful responses. And you can see in brackets, there's sort of a practice or a um, focus that supports these. Um, you know, she invites us to bring playfulness um, to support mindful responses. Um, Unconditional friendliness supports mindful relationships. Gentleness supports mindful speech. Encouragement supports mindful listening. And under mindful presence, she talks about a wake body, tender heart, and open mind. For the next few minutes, I'm going to focus on that first key, mindful presence, um, because in a way, it's a bit of an overarching um, approach that um, she, as she's going through the rest of the, the keys in the book, she's constantly bringing back the importance of the awake body, the tender heart, and the open mind. And I just, I love that, um, that mindset. I love thinking about these three qualities that we can nurture in ourselves to support our ability um, to be mindfully connected to other people, awake body, tender heart, and open mind. Yes, so let's, um, let's talk about awake body for a bit. Oh, wait, there was more I wanted to say about um, mindful presence. Before we get into the kind of awake body, tender heart, and open mind. Um, I guess just acknowledging that most of, um, in communication, most of the information that we convey is nonverbal, which we often learn at most, um, in most communication classes, if you've had a chance to take one. Um, the idea is to have body, mind, and soul functioning as an integrated whole. Um, Right. She also talks about this idea of awake body, tender heart and open mind as our natural communication system. Like it's something that we have in us that um, isn't so much that we need to learn and integrate as to reconnect with and re remember, if, if that makes sense. One of those um, uh, innate abilities that you know, often through socialization or 
or um, you know maybe how we were raised or the lessons that we or the ideas we've internalized about ourselves have maybe squashed a little bit. So it's more about uncovering um, and um, supporting. And she talks about positive interruptions to help bring us back to mindful presence. And positive interruptions are intentionally pausing, allowing ourselves to breathe and reconnect with um, ourselves and interrupt our distractive mind. So for each of these awake body, um, tender heart and open mind, we'll also talk about positive interruptions. So the awake body is um, our uh, human innate human capacity to pay attention to our sense perceptions and the environment in the present moment. Um, so really that mindful body scan practice that we did um, is a way to connect with the awake body. Another way to um, help us connect with the wake bodies, thinking about our posture. And you can see, I just sat up a little straighter <laughs> as I read that in my notes and reminder, oh yeah. Uh, so, so posture can be a really helpful tool to, uh, to bring us into connection. Um, so an upright, but not rigid posture, not like that either, um, has a calming effect on our mind. So the positive interruption that can bring us back to mindful presence is coming back to our senses. So being positively interrupted by uh, the basic wakefulness uh, of our body. Um, our body is awake to everything that is going on around us. So it's things like literally, it's cliche, but stopping and smelling the roses right, is, is a positive interruption or reveling in, you know, the smell of my hazelnut coffee <laughs> in the morning. Um, you know, even noticing, oh, I've got a twinge in my back and maybe doing something to, to help alleviate, you know, the, the discomfort that I'm feeling or pausing and looking out the window and noticing, oh, how beautiful the, the sunset or the dawn is. So just inviting input from our senses can support us in, um, in nurturing those positive interruptions to bring us into an awake body, which allow us to be more present. Do, does that make sense? Um, first, the, the time is, um, let's do a really quick, um, really quick exercise, another one for, for this, and it's called uh, a tuning in exercise. So um, again, it's about bringing ourselves just into a comfortable position. And again, you know, if you'd like, uh, you're welcome to close your eyes or just cast them downward and spending a moment, once again, getting in touch with your breath just to bring us center and calm and just let your shoulders relax a little bit. So let's just take a moment to imagine that our sense of hearing is a radio and it can tune into different stations. And for just a moment, see if you can tune into sounds that are the furthest away from you. Maybe it's a car on the road outside. Listen to the sounds furthest away. Now let's change the station. See if you can tune into the sounds that are in the room you're in. Now let's change the station again and bring our listening awareness to the sounds of our body. Can you hear your breathing? Maybe your heartbeat, maybe a little stomach rumbling. Perhaps a quick scan to each part of your body, starting with your toes up through your legs, hips, back, arms, shoulders, neck, and head. Are there any sounds?
And now let's change the station again and listen just to the breathing. Now let's tune back into the sounds in the room. And tuning once again to those far away sounds. All right, we'll let this exercise go and when you're ready. Open your eyes. So I really, I love this idea of positive interruptions. And I think our, our physical senses, taste, sound, hearing, sight are just, it's, if we allow ourselves to have those positive interruptions, our, our body plays such, um, is such an amazing tool to support us in mindful presence. So that's the awake body. The next tool in mindful presence is a tender heart. And of course, I, I love this so much. And it speaks to, again, I, I, the, the, the self-compassion, which I, I feel is foundational to positive mental health. Um, a, a tender heart is the raw emotional energy of open communication. And it's unconditionally friendly it's naturally we first, okay. um, connecting through breath is a very powerful way to awaken a tender heart. Um, and the positive interruption in, uh, in a tender heart um, is allowing ourselves to be interrupted by flashes of, of empathy. It's when we allow ourselves um, you know, to hear those messages from our heart that we can abruptly change course sometimes. And it, encourage us, is, it encourages us to blur that dividing line that we can often have between um, me and you. Um, our me first preoccupation can get interrupted and we can restore our connection with others. So an invitation is to think about a time when you've experienced empathy and maybe when you know, you've uh, been able to shift from a defensive me first reaction in a situation um, to one that is more we first. I think we all have many times in our day actually when, when we can be um, pause and see if we can't be um, motivated to come from, from a heart-based space. And um, it's, it's really quite amazing the, the shift that, that can happen. So there's so much more to, to unpack with, uh, with, all, with all three of these. Um, but let's just now take a moment to look at the third um, quality of uh, mindful presence um, and open mind, which is our innate human capacity to penetrate our own misunderstandings, to be honest, curious, and insightful, and to be willing to, to let go of our preconceived ideas and opinions. Um, we can connect with this open mind through meditation practices. It's one helpful way to help us get there. And um, learning to let go of our thoughts and the drama they can, they can trigger. So the positive interruption that can support us in moving into a, an awake mind space is um, being willing to notice and um, sit with any moment of doubt that might come up in our open mind. And, and this is not about embracing, um, uh, this is a positive doubt or intelligent doubt, which is different than sort of a negative self doubt, right? Which is a lack of confidence in our body, soul, and mind. It's not about that. It's just about a willingness to um, be open to perhaps seeing things differently, or at least acknowledging 
that somebody else's truth is just as valid as, as our truth in that moment. So we're letting go into uncertainty, which can be really, it, it can be a challenging thing for us. We often really cling to and, and, and have a need for certainty. Um, we stop caring so much about being right and making room for another person's point of view. So can you think of a time when you discovered you were wrong and let go of your position in the middle of a conflict and, and you know, was that able to shift things for you? Okay. So um, again, this is all unpacked beautifully. As I said, I'm just sort of, you know, for the last few months been reading this and looking to integrate this into my own uh, my own practice and my approach, but I think it's it's really powerful. And if you at all resonated with any of this, I could not recommend this book anymore. Like I um, could hold a parade for this book. It's um, uh, it's really well written in a in an approachable way. And again, I just love I love the framework. So um, here we are. Then um, here is the general. Um, well, here are more books. I love books. And these are the books that um, recently over the past few year, years have really jumped out at me um, that are connected to, to mindfulness. So of course, you'll see the five keys of mindful communication there. Um, I mentioned the mindful path to self compassion earlier by Christopher Germer. Um, a lovely, beautiful book. Um, burnout is a came out in the past couple of years. And um, it's really an accessible, awesome book um, of learning to how to do our own emotional regulation. And in fact, they do a really great job of explaining and unpacking polyvagal theory in, um, in this book, um, as well as a practice of, of self-compassion. And of course, Deb, Deb Dana's book, Anchored, which is a... Um, uh, a really great uh, overview of polyvagal theory. And, um, and then looking at mindfulness, actually that one I do have right here. I loved, I loved this book. I don't know, it's all blurred out, oh, it's unfortunate. But um, I really loved it because it takes you through a, um, an exploration of art and um, art and mindfulness. So if you if you do like uh, visual arts and like paintings and things like that, you'll especially love um, looking at mindfulness. Um, and I think that that's about it. I'm going to stop sharing right now, if I can find the, there it is. And what I will do is I'm going to put a link in the chat which is um, a link to the resource resources. Um, of course, there are a gazillion more resources out there uh, for sure. But these were the ones that I mentioned um, and some, some other ones that you might find, find helpful, um, like some links to some online meditations. There's a beautiful meditation called a mountain uh, meditation, which is there some apps that I have been using, um, and then some websites and, and articles that you may find helpful. So, so that is what I have. And um, I, I hope uh, that this has been um, a little, little informative for you, uh, maybe a little, um, uh, yeah, supportive in, in just promoting the idea of the importance of that um, uh, fully present, non-judgmental, uh, mindful presence that we can nurture and support for ourselves and for the, the folks that, that we work with. So if anybody has any comments or questions or wants to chat a little bit, um, why don't I stop recording? Uh, I'll thank the people who are watching the recording for being with us and um, 